Well, welcome to this afternoon's masterclass, the final masterclass of this year's Cellissimo. And it's a little bit different. We are delighted to be joined by the American cellist, Natalie Haas, who is actually participating in quite a significant way in our festival. She has her own show coming to you tomorrow evening called Hop the Cello, where she <laughs> examines the role of the cello in traditional music and has a whole array of guests to discuss this interesting topic and then has a performance as well with Irish musicians. So that's going to be fantastic tomorrow evening here on Music for Galway over on musicforgalway.ie. But right now she's going to work with our eight students who are standing by and she's going to lead them kicking and screaming into the traditional world. So <laughs> Natalie, thank you for joining us. I know you're in Spain at the moment and that's nice to hear. And um, I'm delighted that you're with us and I wish you a really nice class. Thank you so much, Finian. It's such a pleasure to be here and uh, to get a chance to work with all of these amazing young players. Um, so if you guys want to uh, turn your cameras on so I can see you, um, and I would love uh, if we could just begin by introducing ourselves. Um, and if you could just tell me a little bit about your own experience um, as a cellist, if you have any experience with traditional music, I'd love to know about it. Um, and maybe I'll call on you one by one to just int introduce yourselves, but maybe I'll introduce myself first because we've never met before and you might not know me. Um, I grew up playing classical music, like I'm sure all of you are doing. And um, but I, I, from a very young age, I, I was introduced uh, first to Scottish music. Actually, um, I, I'm come from California, and I started going to summer music camps there as a kid, and got um, really into the traditional music world um, of the fiddle. And it just so happened that the, this fit, particular fiddle camp that I started uh, learning at also had a cello class and um, and cello, cello, you know, is not often something we associate with traditional music, but in Scotland, it actually does have a history um, going back to the sort of mid 1700s. And uh, for some reason, didn't make it across the pond to Ireland as much. Um, we'll explore more of why that is tomorrow night. But uh, I find that it, it really works well, uh, just as an accompaniment to the violin um, in traditional music. Uh, they kind of, they grew up together and they kind of belong together. Cello um, works great as a bass instrument um, for providing bass lines and sort of more rhythmic parts for, for dancing. Back in Scotland, uh, it would have been fiddles and cellos playing for dances a couple hundred years ago um, in the same era as, as Bach and, you know, all these amazing European composers. Um, and probably the players would have been doing both. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of only in the last few, hundred years or so that these worlds have become so divorced but um i grew up doing both and i, I love uh, irish music as well as scottish music I, I started at the fiddle camp we had a, some great irish players come like martin hayes and uh, liz doherty and Mairead namuni and liz carroll um more uh kind of in um, american irish but um yeah so i i've i've had some exposure to irish music and uh and I've, I've spent the last sort of 20 years of my life kind of figuring out what the role of the cello is uh, in this music. But what I love about this instrument is that it's so versatile and it can be not only a bass instrument, like I, I said earlier, uh, which is how it was used kind of more traditionally, but it can also be a melody instrument. It can copy almost verbatim everything that the fiddle can do, the cello can do. Um, and it can also um, fill other roles in the ensemble, like uh, more of a, a rhythm section instrument, like a guitar or a bazooki um, for playing rhythm and a harmonic accompaniment uh, to melodies. So the idea today is that we're going to kind of explore a little bit of all of these areas. I'll, I'll, I'll teach you a couple of Irish traditional melodies, and then we'll go in deep on each one of them. and. Uh, talk about all the stylistic elements that kind of makes it come to life uh, for playing for a dance um, and also sort of being very linguistically informed as well. Um, and then talk about how we might use the cello in other roles besides just a melodic one. Um, so kind of um, 
coming at it from underneath, looking at the chord structure and what kinds of rhythms work um, and how to express these on the cello. So that's my plan for today. I would love if you guys would just introduce yourselves and let me know if you have had any experience with traditional music. I would love to hear about it. Um, tell me your name, where you're from, uh, what you're excited about right now with the cello. Uh, let's start with Zoe, since I see you're unmuted. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm double checking that I am yet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hi. Uh, lovely to meet you. Um, I so my name's Zoe Nagel. Um, I, I predominantly have always played classical um, cello. I haven't really got that much experience playing in different styles. Um, but it's something that I would absolutely love to give a bit more time to. Um especially because I'm actually, I'm studying in Munich in Germany at the moment. Mm. And it's amazing how many people who are from, you know, so many different parts of the world are so um, interested in Irish music specifically. And Absolutely. there's such a, there's such a lovely appreciation for it. So it's definitely something that I'd like to explore a bit more. Fantastic. Great. Well, good, good start um, today, <laughs> hopefully. Uh, Robert, you're the next one on my screen. <laughs> How are you keeping? Good, thanks. Uh, so yeah, my name is Robert Murphy. Um, I am a final year student at the Cork School of Music. Um, just like Zoe, I kind of predominantly, I've always played classical music. I don't really have much experience with uh, trap music at all but uh, it's something that I do enjoy listening to and uh, I have wanted to start playing it uh, I was never planning on playing on the cello it's more I think I'm play starting playing on the fiddle because I can't play a small bit of it but um yeah but yeah so I've no experience really playing any trap but it's something I am really interested in fantastic great um I'm gonna just keep going around my screen here how about Michael hi uh I'm Michael um, like most of the people here, I'm from uh, Cork, and again, like most of the people, unfortunately, I've also not got a great exposure to anything outside of classical music. Um, <laughs> I started with the Suzuki method as a kid, and for a while, I was playing drums as well, so I played a bit of trad drums, but I mean, that was only for probably six months or something. So, okay. um, but ever since then, I've always wanted to delve back into... Um, trad because of like the historical context and the cultural context and all that so uh, yeah no, i'm really excited to dive back into it i suppose awesome yeah we'll we'll explore uh, a little bit of how to make the cello sound like a drum today <laughs> it may sound like a foreign concept but it is possible <laughs> um great hallam hi hello um, hello i am here in cork and um, and yeah, I have I have like zero experience with playing any trad. Like I listen to a lot of trad and I really like trad, but I've never attempted it on the cello or any instrument for that matter. So yeah. Okay. Great. Well, it's a good place to start. Thanks for joining us. Um Catherine. Hi, it's nice yes. to meet you. Likewise. Um, I'm my name is Catherine. Um, I'm from Mullingar in the Midlands, and like I, pretty much everyone else, I've never really attempted trad on the cello, or yeah, just played classical music really. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm I'm really interested in exploring it. Wonderful. Yeah, so glad you could join us. Thanks, uh, Patter. Um, Am I saying that right? Yeah, that's it. That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can't really hear you too well. Uh, I'm from Dublin uh, and I'm studying here in Dublin as well. Um, and yeah, uh, despite the fact that I'm an Irish speaker and I'm interested in Irish culture, I've never had any musical exposure or play. Oh, sorry, I should say I, I would listen to quite a bit of trap music when I was mm. older and I would love to play it as well. But I've always been a bit, um, you know, too afraid maybe of. Um, trying it on the cello or anything like that so but mm. i'm really like yeah i'm really excited um about, about it so uh but as i said no, it's, you know it's, it's... okay great well 
Awesome. That's a great place to start, actually. Plain slate. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Isaac and Adrian, do you introduce yourselves? Hi, um, I'm Isaac Bovier. I'm uh, also a, a Californian. Oh, uh, great. <laughs> yeah, no, Los Angeles. Uh, where about are you from? Uh, San Francisco Bay Area, originally. Ah, uh, you got the best coast and you got the best <laughs> cities. So. But anyways, yeah, no, so um, we're obviously, you know, both cellists here at the University of Limerick Irish World Academy of Music. Um, my experience with uh, trad has been next to nil, cellistically. Um, I grew up listening to Illin Pipes and going to a lot of concerts of uh, trad musicians coming into Los Angeles, like Danu and Luna Sa and like other ones like that, and they're amazing. Um, but I had never thought that there could be a correlation between the two, but that's, um, that's what I'm really excited about to uh, work with today. Awesome. Uh, just to briefly introduce myself, I'm Adrian from Croatia, and obviously I'm studying here with Isaac at the University mm -hmm. of Limerick. Uh, and besides learning a few Irish tunes last year as a part of our, our course, I didn't have much experience uh, with trad music, especially not on cello. Like I'd like to explore more how to apply it to our instrument. Mm. I'd love to hear some Croatian traditional music. I don't know what that sounds like, but I, I'm sure it's amazing. <laughs> um, <Well> depending. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I've, I've had some wonderful experiences working at UofL with, with the cellists and the trad music program there and even actually some in the in the classical problem program who are are interested in traditional music so it's great that you guys have that kind of crossover um opportunities there um yeah well wonderful to meet you all thank you uh so much for for taking part um and if you could please make sure you're all muted um for this because we're gonna learn by ear um which means that um first listening the most important part of, of learning by ear. Um, so I'll play a tune for you. We'll start, um, I had a, a couple tunes in mind. Uh, we'll try different, uh, a few different types. It's actually very hard to find, you know, you are saying, uh, Robert, earlier about thinking about wanting to play it on the fiddle. It, it really makes more sense on the fiddle. Cello is kind of, we're adding a bunch of extra difficulty by, by trying to do it on the cello, but uh, it's, it's still really satisfying. Um, and it's even more satisfying when you find fiddle tunes that, that actually sit well on the cello. And I can tell you from experience, they're very rare. <laughs> um, and I know you're all well versed in classical, so you have no problem technically getting around the instrument. And that actually really helps when you're, when you're trying to convert uh, fiddle tunes onto the cello. But uh, uh, the two that I have in mind today are, are actually, from a technical standpoint, fairly simple. And that I wanted to keep it that way because um, I want us to really focus in on stylistically what makes this music tick. And obviously I'm coming at it from the point of view of an American who plays actually mostly Scottish music. <laughs> so you can take everything that I say with a grain of salt, but um, I love Irish music and I love to listen to it. and. Uh, I think the Scots and the Irish actually share a lot um, of the same kind of bowing uh, tr uh, ideas and um, left hand ornamentation ideas, um, and some of which will be familiar to you as classical musicians and some of which will be completely new. So um, the process here uh, is that I, you'll play, I'll play it first and you'll listen and sort of absorb, and then I'm going to break it down into phrases. Um, and you can always listen first uh, and then um, play along. So we'll, we'll just do many repetitions of the same phrase before we move on to another one. And, you know, first and foremost, get the notes and the rhythms. Uh, second, most important, and actually not any, any less important than the notes and the rhythms is bowings and left hand. And I'll, I'll talk you through some sort of typical patterns and typical mm -hmm. ornaments that you find, uh, which are mostly borrowed from the pipes, actually, you know, fiddle, uh, at least in Scotland, and I'm sure this is true to some degree in Ireland as well. Um, if, uh, pipes are kind of an older instrument, so the fiddle, everything that they're doing is kind of trying to imitate the, the sounds of ornamentation on the pipes. Um, and so we're doing the same thing, one degree of separation more, because it's easier to copy a fiddler's ornamentation than a piper's. Um, anyway, so the, the first tune I had in mind is a march. It's, uh, it comes from Donegal. Um, it's actually one of the tunes that I'm going to play tomorrow night in the concert with uh, 
my, my two pals from Donegal. Um, it's called The March of the Mean Natoshan Bull. And uh, Patter can maybe correct me on my Irish pronunciation, but uh, I, I know there's a story there. I, I can't remember what it is, but Kieran uh, Namuni, who's the fiddle player uh, playing with me tomorrow night, will, will probably tell you more about it. Um, anyway, it's in a, sort of a Dorian. Um, so lot, lots of modal music. Um, so the A Dorian scale has the, the raised sixth in it. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to be using. And it's actually all in first position because I'm going to take it down an octave um, from where it would normally be played on the fiddle. Um, and just because we get better ornamentation possibilities in the lower positions, um, as, we're, as we're shifting more, we kind of have to... A sacrifice some some left hand ornaments which is really crucial to making it stylistically sound uh kind of aware so um yeah we're not going to be dealing with anything too technically challenging but um all of the characters coming from the the bowings and the the art articulation and the left hand stuff which we'll talk through as we go but let me just play you the tune first so you can hear it um a a b b is very typical form for trad tunes so it goes like this, and actually the two parts are quite similar. So once you learn one, you know most of the other. Here we go, March of the Minatushan Bull. <laughs> Um, and sort of little tiny micro variations every time. Um, so uh, yeah, you got your head around the scale that we're using. Um, I'm gonna break it down into phrases and uh, show you the notes first and we'll kind of talk through some of the left hand stuff and the bowing as we go. Um, so first phrase goes like this. Um, I'll slow it down a bit. <laughs> Let's just play that together. One, two, three, go. Yeah, um, and I might switch the camera view so you can see what's going on in the bow at some point. But um, actually, before we learn any more notes, let's just talk a little bit about the left hand, um, all of the possibilities, because actually this is what makes each individual player kind of sound different from one another, is when and how they choose to ornament. So some of the possibilities, um, you can do what we call a hammer-on, so which would be coming from the note below. And all of this is really kind of imitating the sound of the Gaelic language, uh, which appears in the pipes and the fiddle as well. So, so coming from the note below, we would call that a, I would call that a hammer-on. And you can practice these by doing sort of four iterations of each. And then the opposite of that would be the pull-off. So starting from the note above. And it's actually useful to, to try these on all fingers. So you could do it maybe like half of a scale. So if we were to stay on this key, um, I'm, I'm gonna stay on the D string because it feels like a good place. Um, so let's try four iterations of each going up the scale on the D string. So starting with the hammer on. right <laughs> so this is where the fiddle has a slight advantage over the cello because they would have one more um so that was the uh hammer on let's try the pull off so the opposite um let's go actually use the open d string as well so the one from above the melody note notice that the way that I'm articulating these is very different from the way you use 
ornamentation in classical music. Um, I think, and, and maybe not so different from Baroque. I mean, these, again, these traditions, Baroque and, and the traditional music were existing, coexisting at the same time. So there, I'm sure there is some overlap, but um, the, the way that it, it sounds like a pipe to me is that it's very articulated. So you want them to be kind of very fast acting. The, the pitch itself is not so important. It's more about the rhythmic effect that you're creating. So I'm barely kind of grazing that note, the ornament note. So you want to kind of teach your hands to be sort of very fast acting and uh, you know, um, not you don't need a full pressure um, on the note to make it sound. It's, what you really want to, us to hear is the rhythmic effect of it. Um, so a couple more uh, before we go back to the tune. Um, you could start from the melody note and uh, go down. So I'm just adding one extra note before, right? Different from the hammer on, but because you're actually starting on the melody note. So that one I call a warble because you're actually barely lifting your finger off. Yeah, right? Um, and then you could do the opposite. So start from the melody note, go to the note above. I would call this a flick. And I'm sure I Irish music has different terms for them, but <laughs> I think everybody does. Um, the flick and we're already out of notes so I should have started on the open string so you four iterations of each right so we got four choices now there's also sort of a combination ornament which would be to go from the note below the melody note go to the note above the melody note and then finally land on the melody note. So you're kind of making making us crave it even more by waiting. Then you're already out of fingers, right? So not a lot of options there. Um, but yeah, the, the the secret to these is just how how fast your fingers are moving. It's just very quick quick reflexes and uh, just grazing the note. The pitch itself not important. So that's a combination one. Uh, let's try one that also is shared by classical music, actually. And I, th I think you would call this a turn. Um, in, Ir in Irish music, you call it a roll. So that, that's what it sounds like slowed down. So you're starting on the melody note, going to the note above, back to the melody note, note below, back to the melody note. So it's a five note ornament. And that's what it sounds like slowed down. So similar to classical music. Right, those are the notes. Now you want to just compress everything so it becomes more of a rhythmic device. We can do that again. Right, so that's the roll. Um, and that might take some practice to get that to, to sound clear. And it, it's going to be used in different ways, depending on what type of tune it is. If it's a jig, I'm going to do a jig with you after we do this march. Um, you can use it like to kind of separate a group of three eighth notes, or I guess you call them, you call them quavers there. So that would be six eight. Um, and in a reel, it might uh, be, or a, a march. So the march is 4-4. Four, four. Um, another ornament, which is actually not a left-hand ornament, it's a right hand. Um, and I think in some cultures they call this a cut, and in Scotland they call it a bowed triplet. Um, I think it might be a cut in Ireland as well. Um, I know that's what it's called in Cape Breton, Ireland in, uh, in Canada. But let me just show you what's happening with the bow, because we're actually going to use this ornament for this tune. So, sorry, yeah, my head's gone. But uh, the idea here is that it's, it's not really a triplet. A triplet is a misnomer for this, but it's kind of like a little energy packet. 
So what you want to do is you want to place your bow in the string with a lot of pressure, sort of towards the balance point, between balance point and middle, I would say. Uh, get, get a lot of pressure kind of stuck in the string and ready for action. And then you want to, with your wrist, let me just show you, uh, maybe I'll pull my camera up a little bit here. With the wrist, a little spasm you know, a little shake, um, and it's going to come out sounding three notes, two short and one long, but the accent is on the first of those short notes. So it's, you're kind of a release of pressure, and then you just let the string carry the bow after that. And you can, you can do another up bow to, to be able to repeat it. So let's add that up bow in. you ever do one of those you want to make sure you get a good attack by starting in the string with that pressure and then release and then restart um, and that's just on one note but in Irish music you, you, you often do it on moving notes so so it's you know um, there if you were to see it written on a piece of music um, paper it would look like two semi uh, semi quavers and a quaver but that's not what it is really it's those two semi quavers get condensed so it's just this little energy packet of, of rhythm so um, you'll you'll hear that come up in the a part of this tune um, so those are our ornament possibilities and I'm sure there's more there's you know trills I you find that less I, maybe you could do a two you know you'd want to whatever you do you want to make sure that it has a rhythmic intent um, or if you're in a slow air, it could be more of a linguistic effect. Um, you know, and like someone like I, met, I mentioned Martin Hayes earlier, the fiddler. Um, I believe he's from Cork, isn't he? Uh, or somewhere around there, thereabouts. Um, but he's the master of, I think, in Ireland you use more slides than, than we, they do in Scotland. I'm not doing it very well. Oops, sorry, let me turn that alarm off. Um, anyway, uh, lots of left-hand possibilities for color and, and to, to add character to the music. So every note that you play, uh, you know, you don't, you don't have to put an ornament on every single note, but the whole thing as a package is just dripping with language and, uh, you know, otherwise it's just, it could be a Suzuki piece. That's what it sounds like with nothing, just single bows and no left hand, but if... So I did one there, um, one of those little cuts. Um, you hopefully can hear the difference there that really what makes this music is the is the stylistic uh, inflection so let's go back to our first phrase uh, let me play it again so i slowed that ornament down so that one is sort of another combination ornament i would call that a waterfall just because of the motion kind of brings us down so you can do that uh, sped up first phrase let's play that a few times one two three and yeah and with the bow what I'm trying to do is um, this is also probably different from classical music um, usually you want to sort of correct so that you're always kind of starting phrases on a down bow um, but what you want to avoid is having too many accents on strong beats so so in this music the strong beat would be one two three four one two three four one two, three, four, one one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and kind of where you want to pop your foot. Then you hopefully you can hear that that just kind of kills it <laughs> if I put too many of those accents on. So what I want to tr try and do with the bow is get away from having hard bow changes in that part of the bar. So I'm going to do some sort of syncopation with the bow to, to get away from those hard accents on the strong beat. So I'm going to go... First of all, I'm going to slur that so that ornament kind of connects those two notes. And then I'm slurring into a strong beat. So it's a little 
little bit of syncopation in the bow there. Two notes slurred uh, at the end of the bar. So let's try that with all the little things. Uh, one, two, three, and. Great. And then the next bit. And I'm just doing that uh, as it comes. No fancy bowing. So that's two, three, four. So that's the end of that phrase. So we'll tack that on to the end. Here's the whole thing. So the important thing here is to kind of, we want to, again, as I said, uh, take the emphasis off of the strong beat and also kind of look out uh, or zoom out and look at the bigger rhythmic picture. What accents are important um, and can we make it sort of a longer phrase by increasing the rhythmic wavelength? <laughs> A lot of different ways by changing where you're putting the accents on your bow. So I like that. I am putting an accent on a strong beat, but I'm, I'm then I'm getting off of that. So I'm putting it on beat two of the second bar, where I had one and three on bar one. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. And you can create kind of rhythmic tension by doing stuff like that. So we'll, we'll continue to do that as, as we go. But let's play that first phrase a couple more times. One, two, a one, two, three, and. Yeah, I think I did another little ornament. I never really know what it, what's gonna come out, but uh, on the E of the second half of the phrase. So again, very fast acting because they, they go by quite quickly with these uh, left-hand ornaments. Great, um, and then the great thing about traditional music is that you have a lot of repetitive material. So you already know probably 80% of the tune at this point. <laughs> um, so the, the, the same question phrase happens again. That's the same as before, we've done that. New ending. So there, I'll, I'll let's do the notes first, and then we'll talk about bowing. So I'm going to add a, a little cut onto the end. So just straight, uh, separate bows. And then for the second half, I'm going to do the cut and slur out of it into the next downbeat, which makes an interesting rhythmic phrase because again, you're not getting a hard accent on a downbeat. So we have... So I'll show you what the bow is doing there. Just, uh, just that one slur at the end. Slurring out of that little cut. Uh, one more time. One, two, three, and... Yeah, and hopefully you can hear that where the accent is there. Uh, again, trying to not do too many hard accents on strong beats. I'm kind of putting it on the offbeat. One, two, three, four. So you could put it... Uh, I'm kind of over-exaggerating there, but that, that's what I'm aiming for. Yeah, and feel free to add any little left-hand stuff. But maybe if you have a, a repeated note, it's good to kind of add a little spice to the second occurrence of it, for example. Yeah, so just one extra little ornament in that phrase. So that was a flick from the E to the F sharp. So let's do that in context. So the whole of phrase two will be that same call phrase from the beginning. That was answer one, and then we have the same call phrase with answer two. So let's try that whole opening. One, two, three, go. To show you what's happening with the bow there actually because um, of the way that we end phrase one we're at the tip here so it naturally puts us in a 
awkward position for phrase two. Now we're bowing in a completely different way. So what, what I might do is just add a slur. And then I'm back into the same bow pattern I did before. So first one starts down bow. Second one starts up, and then I'm going to slur there. To get back into my pattern. Uh, right, so let's do that a few times. We'll just loop that those two phrases. One, two, ready, go, and... Now we have a new ending. <laughs> right, uh, sorry, I, I broke the loop. This is where, in the phrase, we are going to end the A part. <laughs> Okay, so that happens twice. So when you have the same repeated material like that, it's kind of nice to add a little variation to the re repeat. So I'm going to do another cut there. So I'm just adding an F sharp between the E and the G. Uh, and bowing wise, so this is coming out of... You're at the tip again. So let's add a slur here to get sort of back onto our down bow positive strong beat grid. I'll talk more about the grid later. <laughs> so that's what I'm doing bowing wise. I'm adding a slur to the beginning of this bar and then I'm going to do the putt and another slur. Yeah, let's try that. So two, three, go. Yeah, and a couple more ornaments there, left hand wise, if you want to add those in. You can, it's a really good policy when you're first learning a style to copy verbatim somebody else's uh, tricks. And then at some point, you'll sort of boil that down to what you like and have your own kind of style emerge. So I'm doing one, another little flick there, just like in the earlier phrase. And then the cut, a little waterfall at the end. And to end, another cut. So just separate bows. Um, so we got and this is a very common pipe thing. If you have a note of the same pitch as a piper, at least in Scotland, you know, with the Highland pipes, they're just blowing continuously, right? So they have no, they have no equivalent of our bow as an articulator. So all of the articulations have to be finger ornaments. Um, so if you have a note of the same pitch, you can't just eh, eh, <laughs> with your mouth. It would sound horrible. Um, so, and I, I think Ellen Pipes works the same way. You would have to like scrunch the bag up twice if you wanted to hear the same note twice and it would come out sounding horrible. So you have to, you have to do something to separate a note of the same pitch in addition to a bow change. And it could be instead of a bow change or you could do both. So I'm doing both. Changing bows and putting a little flick to separate those two A's. So at the end, that's our, our ending. But we have... Right? Uh, so let's do that whole ending. So I'll show you what the bow is doing. We're going to start up bow slur. One, two, three, and... Yeah, so that bar, first bar has two slurs. Up bow. Another up bow slur separate good and I'm going to add a couple notes onto the end which will serve as sort of pickup notes between a parts so we have that the, going down to the C string um, and then we're back into the repeat of the A section so you've got the whole A part uh, which means you actually have most of the tune at this point <laughs> so let's play the whole A add those three pickup notes and we'll do another A. So play two A's back to back as if we were doing this in context. From the top. Uh, so I'll show you uh, this view once and we'll do it with the bow view once so you can copy the bowings. Here we go. One, 
to from the top and <laughs> the essence of the A section. Let's try it one more time. And uh, if you want to copy my bowings, I actually recommend, this is a, a technique that I don't think gets used in classical music a lot, but is su super helpful in traditional music uh, when you're trying, you know, because in classical music, you'd be reading somebody else's bowings, but this is more of a visual, visual thing. Uh, so I, I find it actually really helpful to just, if you're learning a new style, air bow, <laughs> you know, just sort of uh, copy the bowings uh, without actually playing any of the notes so that you're pure, purely focusing on your right hand um, and sort of internalizing the, the feeling of, of the bowing. Um, so that's a technique you can try if you want or, or play along, your choice. Here we go, uh, whole thing again, two A's, one, two, three, and... <laughs> you can feel free to either raise your hand this way or or do the raise hand function or just type it into the chat um, otherwise I'll just keep going let's try the B section so a um, lot of repeated material here so you are already know most of it but um, the the call phrase the the uh, initial sort of question um, changes very slightly so here's the question for the B part it just starts with an octave jump and again, because we have two A's back to back, I'm gonna separate it with a flick. And it doesn't even matter which finger you do it on because again, the pitch is not important. You can do it with any finger. And nobody would know the difference. So, uh, so um, here's the new question, the whole thing. Exact same bowing technique. So I'm gonna actually slur that. Let me just show you the bow. Uh, sorry. Kind of also helps to uh, hide the string crossing in addition to hiding that strong beat accent. And then I'm gonna do a two note slur again, syncopated. That's our new question phrase. So one, two, three, go. Yes, um, and I'm adding one more ornament there, sort of a little waterfall from the E to the D at the end. Good, and then we have the same answers. That's the same as the A part, right? So let's tack that on. One, two, three, and. the same uh, new question again I think that's maybe slightly variation from the A part new answer I can't remember if that's the same as the A part or not so that that's the new answer and again I, I'm kind of slurring out of that cut Right? Uh, so let's do phrase two. One, two, three, and. One, two, three, and. One thing that I didn't mention at the beginning that I maybe should have is you'll notice that I'm using open strings. And I know that this is something that is kind of frowned upon in classical music. Um, it is. Uh, really important i think to mimic the sound of the fiddle which has this very bright quality 
right? So I think as many open strings as you can use, the, the brighter your sound will be. So we're not going for beauty of tone necessarily here. We're going for uh, rhythmic effect. Um, so yeah, open strings all the way uh, when you have the option. And very little vibrato as well. It's, it's not so much a part of the style because it kind of gets in the way when you want to use these left hand ornaments. You know, uh, and I, this is a problem I see a lot with class, people coming from classical music trying to learn traditional music. It's really hard to turn this off. Once it's been turned on, <laughs> it's kind of a constant that, um, that doesn't go away uh, unless you really make a conscious effort to, to stop it. Um, and once you do, you open up this actually very kind of vulnerable sound um, and allow time for all this linguistic stuff to come through that if you're vibrating you kind of don't don't have the space for so just just keep that in mind <laughs> as you're learning this uh, let's try the beginning of the B part so phrases one and two So one, two, three, and... Great. Um, let's do that one more time. I'll show you the bow. Uh, not a lot of slurring going on there, but a, a few key placed ones will make it uh, sound a little bit more interesting rhythmically, phrasing-wise. One, two, three, and... One thing that differentiates this music is the way that you're using bow pressure. It's kind of a constant, uh, the, the way that you get these accents to speak is that there's a constant pull of, of uh, giving pressure versus releasing. Um, <laughs> there to be so much connectedness between your notes because then you just sort of lose all of that those rhythmic accents so each each beginning of each note should be very articulated and that's uh, sort of key to, to playing in any style of dance music um, is is really being very um, sharp with your articulations. Um, yeah, great. Uh, then we have phrase three. <laughs> totally identical to phrase one. <laughs> um, and then we have uh, same ending as the A part. <laughs> Sorry, I will do the variation. <laughs> so actually, you know the whole thing. The only thing you're missing are the pickup notes. Uh, so when you're going into a B section, you're going to go just play a scale and use those for the B part pickup. So when we're in A section, we're going to do the low one. When we're in a B section, going to those pickups and it, it helps because it the second note is a B, so that may be a mnemonic device to remember that. So here's the whole B part. Um, maybe listen once and... Try that air bow thing if you want, uh, just to hear how the phrases are connected together. So here's the whole B. at the end there to get back into an A section. And also the B part and the A part are very similar. So I'll just let you in on the secret that A part starts with the fifth. B part starts with the octave. Very similar. <laughs> um, right, so we've got a tune here. Actually, I think I added one extra note in the B part. Um, let me just show you the bow view. Uh, at the end of sort of halfway through the B part. <laughs> that before. 
before, but I'm actually going to go uh, just as a variation kind of to get me into the phrase three. So it's kind of a long slur, slurring out of the cut again. And then, yeah, so you're slurring into the downbeat always makes for an interesting rhythmic phrase. Uh, okay, let's try those B parts together. Uh, and I'll stay on this view. You, I don't think you need to see my left hand. You guys know what you're doing. So uh, here we go. One B parts. One, two, three, and. before we go on to um, the sort of rhythmic uh, and chordal treatment of, of this tune. Um, we kind of covered a lot of ground there, so hopefully that all makes sense. Um, the thing about the bow pressure is really key. I think a lot of people, when they hear traditional music for the first time, they, they kind of feel like there's spaces between the notes, so they tend to go more sort of spiccato. <laughs> off the string a little bit between the notes, but really your bow is hardly ever leaving contact with the string. It's all about changes in bow pressure. So just uh, keep that in mind as well. Um, everybody good to go on? Uh, no questions so far? Just let me know if, if uh, feel free to interject it at any point. Um, right, so the cello, in addition to being a melodic instrument is also a chordal one. Um, and uh, as I said before, sort of bass lines would have been traditionally uh, in Scotland, like uh, we have a really great, we, I'm, I'm saying as if I'm Scottish, I'm not Scottish, <laughs> but I sort of grew up playing that music. So I feel like an adopted Scot in some ways, but um, they have uh, manuscripts going back to the 17th, uh, 1700s um, that have bass lines in them. And they're very simple. Uh, they're, you know, a lot of... <laughs> you know it's not complicated and that's all you really need you know uh, it, it began as a melodic tradition and uh, so there wasn't a lot of movement going on in the rhythm part uh, because all you really need is a steady beat and sort of some kind of chordal um, 
sort of information, which a lot of is being spelled out by the melody. A lot of this music is based on scales and arpeggios. So the harmon harmony is kind of easy to, to hear. Um, and it's very drone based as well because it's pipe, pipe music. So you can get away with playing A underneath the entire tune and it would sound perfectly fine. Um, but uh, there's more interesting things that we can do. And, uh, and there's been so many amazing developments in the string playing world in just the last 40 or 50 years that really have changed the way um, string players uh, are, approach rhythmic styles of, of folk music and, and other styles, rock, rock and jazz and pop and all of these things um, where you can treat uh, your instrument as a part of a rhythm section and get sounds like you would get on a drum. Um, and so that that's the idea here is that, you know, if you're to, to take this tune, now you know this melody, you can sit down in a session and play it with other people. It, you know, it might get boring playing the same melody 10 times in a row. So you might want to do something else. And that might actually add more to what's going on in the ensemble. Uh, you kind of have to be sensitive to who else is, is playing. If there's a guitar player present, for example, you kind of have to work in what you're doing to the, what they're doing harmonically and rhythmically as well. But um, if it's just you and a bunch of melody players, then you get kind of free reign over creating um, a, a, a kind of a bed for the melody to sit on. And uh, so you can get harmonically as complex as you want, rhythmically as complex as you want, but it, the whole idea is to support the melody. So um, basically, I'm, I'm going to ask you all to sort of become composers now, and you, you have a melody, and you're going to sort of uh, write a part that is going to go underneath this melody. Um, so let's just do a quick kind of harmonic analysis of what's happening here, um, and then we'll see where we can take it rhythmically. Um, uh, you know, and People don't often consider the cello a, a chordal instrument, <laughs> but uh, it is, it, it can't be, you know, we can only technically play two notes at once, but we can imply a lot. Um, and Bach does this in the cello suites all the time, implying harmonies um, by sort of breaking arpeggios up and that we're going to do that in the chords as well. So um, I think it, it's nice because it's, sort of ambiguous because you don't get a lot of the third of the scale except for in those pickups to the b part you know you can tell that it's a minor tune but but the third doesn't get played very much so it's nice to keep it kind of open voicings so i'm, I'm often playing double stops but i'm going to try and have sort of a a low part of the chord and a higher or middle voice of the chord so you get a fuller picture of, of what's going on. Um, uh, and yeah, so we'll, we'll explore some rhythms here. Um, but first, just a, a quick harmonic analysis. So we have uh, kind of lands. And you want to sort of, again, look at the big picture of where are the important uh beats um and now i'm going back to strong beats so if there's a note that falls on a strong beat that is not within your original chord like a d there second bar downbeat you know that 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 d note is not part of the a chord so there's a chord change there um and usually you know this modal minor music uh usually is just rocking between two chords so we have so really just G and A. Here, the, the note that falls on the strong beat is an E, and that could technically still be part of the A minor chord, but let's look at what else is happening around it. It also has a G, and a D, a B. The A is kind of a passing note. So we have G. It's kind of a G chord, but it has this E on the strong beat, so that's kind of important. So let's make that an E minor, which is almost like a substitute for G because they share two of the same notes. If we're thinking triadically, you have a G chord, you have an E minor chord, and they both share the G and the B. So they're kind of, they can be used interchangeably. So let's just play fifths for now. So we're gonna go uh, just outline where the chord changes are with just a, a kind of a strong note on the downbeat. So, yeah, let's change there. And an E minor. And then 
then here, that second ending, again, that E is pretty prominent in the melody, pretty important. So let's go straight to the E minor. It'll happen a, a, a little sooner than it did in, in the first ending. And here, kind of wants to resolve, but this, this is the thing that, the melody kind of stays fixed in this music. This is different from jazz. Like in jazz, you have the mel all these beautiful solos that are going to happen off of the melody, um, and the chords stay fixed. In traditional music, it's the opposite. The melody stays fixed with slight micro variations, but the chords, um, whoever is playing chords, gets to improvise. Um, so. I, rather than re resolve at the end there, I think it's more interesting to not resolve, which makes us want to go back and play that A part again. So rather than going back to an A chord at the end, I'm going to go to a D because I like the unresolved nature of it. And it also, the D, again, we're in the Dorian scale, so it has an F sharp in it, so it's really D major. Um, but uh, it has that unresolved quality. It also shares the A with the with the A minor chord. So they, they can also be used interchangeably. So now we're talking about chord substitutions. They're again, very simple substitutions, but can be very effective. Um, so this one chord per bar, let's, let's just try to remember that chord pattern. So we have A to G. Again to E minor first ending and then back to A to G and then E minor right away ending on the D. Okay, so let's do that twice. This is a very boring rhythm, but I just want to remember the chords first. One, two, three, go. A. is nice because it makes us then want to go on and play the tune again whereas if it resolved it feels like it comes to a stop um good okay so that's not a very interesting rhythm let's uh try something a little bit uh, more complicated but still not very complicated because we want the melody to be the main focus so i'm going to try some something that's going to add a little bit of punchiness to the to the groove underlying the melody um so I'm going to add, I'm going to make a two bar phrase now. And rather than hitting every downbeat, because again, this is going back to the thing of accenting too many strong beats. It just kind of kills the music and makes it so that the dancers want to go home. I'm going to put my downbeat on the second bar. I'm going to delay it. So I'm going to go, I'm going to give you an accent on one and three in that first bar. But on bar two, I'm going to wait until to play until beat two. So one, two, three, four. And I'm going to add this thing, rhythmic thing, uh, which you may have heard, may have not heard. It's called the chop. And this is what I'm talking about, about the string world having these great developments in the last 40 or 50 years. The chop is a big part of that. <laughs> and all it is, is um, it's a, it, this is what I'm talking about, kind of making it sound like a drum. It's a percussive effect um, that you get by, first of all, straightening your thumb. So it's a little different bow hold. And I've actually, I've chopped so much these days that I just have adapted my bow hold to be like this all the time. But you want a straight thumb because you need something pushing against the stick so that your bow doesn't fall out of your hand. So straight thumb, then kind of pulling back with the rest of your fingers so your bow is nice and solidly in your hand there. And it's kind of, yeah, it's straight, straight thumbs. So you're pushing and then pulling back. Very good, solid hold. And then, uh, yeah, your, your hair angled out away from you as it normally would be, right? Um, and then you're going to kind of come down on the string. If you come purely down and don't move at all, you don't get any sound. <laughs> so you actually have to travel just the slightest bit uh, in order to get a sound. So you're coming down on the string this way and you're also making it like a tiny down bow, but then a, a dead stop. And you want to do this within kind of a couple of centimeters of the frog. And it's actually a lot of it is wrist motion. The guy who sort of invented 
this uh, technique, has, he says it's you're waving goodbye to good technique because <laughs> it's a completely different approach, a uh, different set of, of, of rules for your technique here. So yeah, little wave. He's actually a violin player, so it's a different sort of approach on the cello. But yeah, basically using your wrist to go out and down at the same time. So kind of 45 degree angle towards the floor and a dead stop. And you can do this, you need, you need rosin on that part of your bow. Um, and you can do it, you can kind of vary your contact point and see how that affects the sound. Don't use too much bow. Try doing it on two strings, try doing it on one string, try doing it on different parts of the cello, higher, lower. On the lower strings, you get more bassy sound. And the other element is that the left hand is just damping the strings so that there's no pitch associated with it. So it's like the sound you get off of a snare drum. So it's just giving us that sort of percussive effect of a really strong offbeat, which is what the snare gives you in, in rock and pop music. So we're gonna go. I'm using it to sort of place the downbeat of bar two. And my bow just got stuck on the on the corner of the cello. That's not normal. <laughs> Normally you should be breaking bow hairs while you're doing this. You don't need a lot of pressure. Again, if you're using the wrist, you don't have to force it too hard. So just small motion and a lot of it is just wrist flapping. So let's try that. So we're gonna go one, two, three, four, one. Gonna, after the chop, leave the bow on the string uh, and it's a dead stop and then that G chord will appear then on beat two of bar two. So, But what I want to do here is I, I mentioned the grid earlier and it's very key that we sort of get back to a down bow because what's going on uh, sort of underpinning all of this is that my right hand is sort of turned into a metronome and I'm feeling these tiny subdivisions, but you can try just by damping, damping the left hand so that you don't get any pitch and just very short kind of spiccato strokes at the frog, um, even down and up bows. Sorry, that's not that. thought I'd turn it off. And you can start to sort of accent every four. So I'm feeling that that subdivided beat um, underneath everything, and that is is providing this rhythmic stability to everything that I'm doing. But the the other important thing there is that it's just a back and forth motion with your right hand, which means that you never th have to really think about your bow direction. So what I'm going to do is add an extra bow on that G chord so that I come back to a down and that my grid has started over again. Um, syncopate one so that's bar two it's also mimicking the bowing that I'm doing in the melody if, if you notice um, and then let's do the same thing on, we'll change the, the rhythm slightly for ending two, where we go to the E minor chord. So let's do this. So this is again on the grid. So I'm going to, I'm thinking of da 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 subdividing. So I'm going down, retake. And start with a chop. So this is one, two, three, and four. And so you'll notice that every strong beat, two, three, four, falls down. So you might have to do some extra retaking. So that's our ending too. So the whole thing so far we have. It sounds like a rock riff, right? Uh, but it actually works really well underneath this tune because it's got lots of space in it. So again, leaving room for the melody. Give it a nice strong downbeat. 
So we're gonna, I'm gonna wait until beat two of the second bar to hear that D chord. So again, it's kind of, everything is a little bit syncopated. So two down bows, E to D on this second ending. And I'm making that first occurrence of the E minor chord on the second ending, kind of a, a dead short stop. So let's do that whole, that's the whole A part. Um, again, you've made those those four chords or whatever it is, A, G, E, D, yeah, four chords. Now you have a, a groove and, um, and, a, and a rhythm cycle that's kind of made it into now a whole eight bar phrase rather than repeating the same rhythm at the beginning of every bar or every two bars. So you've made it more interesting by sort of adding little variations in there. So let's do that whole eight part. Boom. To get my pitch right. One, two, three, and. Actually, the, the good thing about this tune is that the A part and the B part from a harmonic standpoint are pretty much equivalent. <laughs> so um, you could actually do exactly the same thing on the B part as you did on the A part. It's often more interesting to, to do something different because that makes you then again want to go back and play the, the same tune again because it's really it's just a 30 or 16 or 32 bar tune and it the idea is that you just play it over and over again and there's slight melodic variations and you just get into this kind of uh, headspace where you're kind of hypnotized <laughs> by this melody but you want to vary it a little bit um, so that the audience doesn't get bored <laughs> um, uh, so one way to do that would be just to choose a different register you can play the same chords in a different octave and with maybe a slightly different texture <laughs> Things, uh, you know, um, change registers, change, uh, that was the same rhythms, same chords, different voicings, different register changed a lot uh, of the way we feel it. Um, you could pick a completely different rhythm, more, more sort of subdividing, more droney. Sort of doing every single subdivision but hearing some just key accents so many different approaches here um you could also change chords uh for example so maybe to make it a little more interesting we could add one more chord into the b part let's make let's add a c chord um so it's kind of again that we'll have this sort of c6 sound so the c fifth uh and the, the melody is on the a so you get kind of that that sound um Let's just add, instead of going to the G straight away, we'll go to the C first. So same thing, just one extra chord there. Um, yeah, and there's, again, take this melody and this set of chords and do as you like with them. I've given you the tools so you can uh, hopefully walk into a jam session and, and play this and have some ideas. Um, so uh, that's the basic approach anyway, is you, you learn a melody and, uh, and it's gonna sort of call for certain chords. Uh, there's some flexibility within that and you can, as the melody gets repeated various times, you can vary quarterly what you're doing, you can vary rhythmically what you're doing, texturally, registrally, lots of um, ways to sort of, uh, you know, it's, 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 impro it, it's improvisation, but it's uh, in a very subtle way. Um, so um, I hope you like the melody. Any, any questions on any of that before we go on to another tune? I think we've got time to do a jig as well. Uh, everybody okay so far? Okay, great. Um, this is a, a tune um, 
which uh, there's actually two tunes by the same name, and one of them is more familiar. This is the less familiar one. It's called The Rolling Waves. Um, so I know you said some of you have listened to a lot of traditional music, so you might have heard the other tune called The Rolling Waves goes like this. <laughs> the one that gets played more in sessions but a quite pretty common session tune i think um this one is uh it has kind of a beautiful symmetry to to the the writing in it which i love um i learned it from another american who's grew up playing scottish and irish music uh called jeremy kittle and uh it goes like this so i'll just play it for you first now we're in a different key d major there's going to be uh, more shifting in this one um so we'll do it in the original fiddle key rather than um, transposing octaves, uh, it goes like this. the symmetry of it the way it sort of turns around and gets back to the a section is really beautiful Sim simple but beautiful um, and again all of the same ornaments apply for the left hand there's some bowing rules for jigs and I, I wouldn't call them rules per se i mean rules are are there but they're meant to be broken so um, a couple things that are very common though that are useful to know is um, one thing that we do so we're in six eight now and uh, one thing that you do to kind of get a little bit of that lilting feel, which is very common uh, in, in Irish music, especially um, in Scottish music too, um, is to slur across beats. And again, it's all about hiding these strong beats, as I was saying, for the other type of tune. Same thing goes for jigs, but it's going to feel completely different because we're subdividing in threes now instead of fours. So... Uh, let me just teach you some of these bowing patterns before we learn the tune. So if we just, on an open D string, we're going to just play, uh, let's just go back and forth for now in six. So one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, accent, accent every three. Yeah, and sort of middle of the bow is where I'm aiming for. And again, as I said, very articulated strokes, but staying on the string. they tend to dot their jigs more. So you have like... In Ireland, I think it, it, less of that. <laughs> um, especially when you're playing for Scottish country dancing, that's very common to have that sort of pointed uh, way of, of playing jigs, which, you know, gets people off the floor. Um, but, uh, yeah. So here's what, what I mean by this cross-beat slur thing. You can do this in, in several ways. I'll teach you the, the easier pattern first. So we're going to, what, what it sounds like is So you're slurring three into one of the next group. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. Two, three, one. But we're thinking in six, right? So I'm, I'm not going to do it every time. I'm going to repeat this as a one bar pattern. So I'll go one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four. So three into four. And you can kind of, so one, two, you can kind of, and this is something you would never do in classical music, right? Uh, sort of do this kind of scoop mid slur. But what I'm doing that for is to show you where the beat is. One, two, three, four, five, six. So now you're at the tip and now you have to reverse it. So this is really great practice for being equally comfortable doing things up bow as down bow it's you know it's a completely different set of rules when you're doing something up bow but if you can get it to sound exactly equal then you know you've reached mastery <laughs> mirror image right one starts down one starts up and you and you can let that slur allow you to travel 
so that you're really using the full length of your of your bow, which is something that you, I mean, probably depends on regionally where you are. Um, I know that there's different uh, style, lots of different styles within Ireland. Um, and I'm just looking at big picture here. I'm not looking at any region in particular, but some styles would be a lot of single bows. And for that, you don't need to travel much, but when you add a slur, you can really allow it to take you to different parts of the bow which are going to op open up different kind of possibilities um we could do the same thing but extend it by two bars so what that would look like is then you're going to get three to three to four and six to one one two three four five six one two three four five six and at that point you're kind of running out of bow so you're going to do the same thing in reverse one two three four five six one two three four five six so let's do it in slow motion. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. The two bars, and then the same thing in reverse. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let's try it in time. One, two, three, go. Reverse. might take a little bit longer than that to learn that was just a very quick look but you can sort of internalize these by practicing them with metronome um, infinitely until it feels good <laughs> um, so uh, we're gonna put that into practice uh, in in context of the tune I'll show you where where it makes sense to do those um, usually when you have a long string of quavers um, but sometimes you, Tunes won't do that. Sometimes we get longer notes and that sort of interrupts the flow of those patterns. Um, let's just break it down from the beginning. So here's phrase one. Those are just notes, right? But let's just learn the notes first. break it down uh, into what is going on with the left hand first. So it's a nice little waterfall at the, right at the top there. And again, we have a repeated note of the same pitch. So we want to do a, something to separate it other than just a bow change. So I'm adding a little flick between the two E's. Let's do that much. So uh, slurring the first two notes, right? And then separate after that. One, two, three, four, five, six. Right, and then you should be at the frog. And another waterfall. This time it's not a straight scale down. So you're skipping the E on the way down. And then I'm gonna add a little pull off on the B. those two together so from the top it's so using the same bowing there for both bars so uh, slurring the first group of three and then separating uh, the second group of three so one more time one two three four five six and then we have the same call phrase. Actually, not exactly the same. Goes up this time. Let's try that. Using the same ornaments at the top there. And then I'm going to go into third position. And there is a great example of that cross beat slur. So slurring three into four. One, two, three, four, five, six. And, or what So a little flick on the D. Very quick again. Uh, so try phrase two. Just that much. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let's do 
two from the top. So phrases one and two together. One, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> Right, um, and you'll notice actually um, on phrase two at the top of it, instead of a uh, no, when you have the uh, repeat of that <clears throat> call phrase, uh, I did a, an extra a sort of a hammer on going into the F sharp. So even adding one more note to the beginning of the ornament. Yeah, there's so many options. When you have a longer note, you have more time. So you can sort of uh, get into more of the detail uh, on whichever ornaments you're deciding to put on it. Um, and again, vibrato just gets in the way of that. So it's really not appropriate for this style. Uh, let's do the same thing again from the top. One, two, three, four, five, six. Great, and then we have uh, the first phrase again repeated. Um, the last two notes are going to change though. So I'm just doing the same thing, but a string down. the end of that phrase and then we have a new ending and here's a great example of again using this cross beat slur thing I'll just show you what's going on there well let's learn the notes first and then I'll show you the bowing it's a very pentatonic major pentatonic melody so those are the notes just all separate bows So here's bowing wise, I'm using sort of the first, uh, the, the, the two bar pattern that we did, the first uh, half of it. So I'm done there and I'm going to reverse directions for the last note. So this requires again, left hand articulation. So those two E's are slurred together. And to hear them as separate pitches, we have to uh, articulate them with the left hand something. So I'm putting a flick in there. So starting three, four, and six to one. One, two, three, four, five, six. And kind of a, a little uh, hammer on into that last note, kind of nice way to arrive at it. And that's the whole A part. So uh, let's play the whole A section a few times. Just get your heads around those bowings and the, and the left hand stuff as well. Again, these are my own ornaments, so you can learn them now and feel free to drop them later <laughs> in favor of your own, or, or you can put less or more or whatever feels good to you. Uh, but again, it should be informed by a lot of listening. So, uh, from the beginning, one, two, three, four, five, six. show you the bow so again feel free to air bow you don't have to actually play along if you don't want to that's the beauty of zoom and not being able to hear <laughs> what you guys are doing you can make as mis many mistakes as you want and I will never know um, one other thing I'll mention is that as a bowing bowing variation rather than uh, separating those notes at the end of the bar because we have that same bowing kind of three times in a row <laughs> I'm doing the same exact thing three bars in a row. So maybe to break that up, I might actually slur the second half of the bar, one of those phrases. Didn't do it yet. I did it there. It just feels
feels good there for some reason. So I'm going to be, um, slurring the second half of the bar as well as the first half of the bar. I wouldn't do that all the time because what it would end up sounding like would be. Again, too many accents on strong beats so that we're, we're trying to avoid that by doing these cross beat slurs. So let's try the whole thing and a bow follow the bowings as best you can. Good luck. Um, a part twice through again. One, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> feels good. Um, a lot of these boings I'm sure will feel quite foreign at first, uh, but once you get them into your body, it really does feel good to do those cross beat slurs. Um, very satisfying. Um, here we go on the B part. I'll, I'll just play it first. Uh, so listen once. So you'll notice there that there's a lot of new material, but there's some repeated material as well. That first ending totally copied from the ending of the A part. Second ending kind of steals that phrase from the A part to get turn us around and get us back into another A section, which is quite nice. Um, so, but we have some new stuff, new material. Um, and as I said before, like the, the downside of playing fiddle tunes on the cello is that when you have to go up into the E string region of the fiddle, you sort of lose some of your fingers that you had in first position for ornaments. So uh, it might sound a little more bare than the A part does uh, because of these shifts, but um, you just do the best you can. Um, we're gonna use that roll, that ornament that we checked out before. So in the context of the jig, the roll is again, it's a really rhythmic device. So what, I, what it's doing is it's kind of breaking up the group of three into like a long note and a short note. So the ornament happens sort of between those two. So you want to, when you land back on the melody note for the last time, that's beat three of the, of the group of three. So you can, all, you can kind of almost um, over accent it uh, again with a, a little mid slur extra scoop in the bow. Let's just try a few of those back to back just to get that uh, rhythmic feel of the roll. <laughs> lean on the first note a little bit longer. Yeah, so you just want to squash that ornament <laughs> as close together as possible. Cool. Uh, so that's going to come in to play later in the, in the B part. So here's our first phrase. Using a little water funnel on the end. Separate to start, and then I'm going to slur here. Slur again. Slur again. So the B part kind of has this uh, sort of more expansive feel to it, I think. So maybe a few more slurs feel nice. And you'll notice that I'm actually using an ornament to kind of hide my shift. So that D, you can arrive from the note below. Um. Let's try that phrase. One, two, three, four, five, six. One more time. One, two, three, four, five, six. Great. Yeah. So basically, just going between first and third positions for this whole thing. the roll. So the end of phrase two starts with the same question phrase. Here's the answer. And 
the rolls at the end there. So all separate bows until you get to the roll. One, two, three, four, five, six. Cool. So in context of phrase two, the whole phrase is... Try that whole thing. One, two, three, four, five, six. Great. Uh, so phrases one and two now. One more time. One, two, three, four, five, six. Here's a great example of where I could use that two bar sort of uh, cross beat slur pattern, except there's some shifting involved. So I might not start slurring until the shifts are not in the way. So I'm gonna just do this as separate bows to hide that shift. Just do that. One, two, three, four, five, six. And on the E, I'm doing a little extra flick which you can add if you want. Um, and then now, this is a good place to put a slur cross beat. Again, so you have to separate with left hand instead of right. So let's try that coming off the F sharp. One, two, three, four, five, six. So you should be at the tip at this point. Uh, let's do that whole thing so far from this phrase. So now we're at the tip, so we can reverse directions. And this is stolen from the A part. This phrase is identical to what we've already done, but we're going to start it in the opposite direction up bow this time. So here's what's going on in the bow there, just uh, to be clear. So starting up bow. I'm going to do all separate on the last bar to make it come out so that when I start the next phrase, I'll be a bit down bow. Okay, so let's do that ending again. One, two, three, four, five, six. Right, so B part so far. This is B1. Um, We'll try the whole thing and keep it on the bow view so you can see the slurs. One, two, three, four, five, six. most of B2 as well and when we get to the ending of B2 all you're gonna do is do that start to the ending but then we're gonna finish it and use that as a turnaround to get back to the A part so let's try that ending second ending of the second B part jumping up up to that borrowed phrase from the A part. So let's start up bow, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then we're back into the A section. Right, so we'll play A, 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 the two A's are identical, B, B, and they have different endings. Um, and then let's do the whole thing again. So uh, we'll let's stay at this tempo for now so you can really concentrate on left hand and right hand uh, bowing patterns, and then we'll speed it up a little bit the second time around. So it's, um, you know, I, I always think it's better to play something slow and really relish it rather than to play it faster than you're capable of and to sort of lose the rhythmic effect of just sitting really deeply in that groove. So, you know, we'll just do this as an experiment right now, but I recommend slow practice with metronome before um, you try to, to play too fast. Often in, in sessions, people end up playing really fast, they're looking for excitement and they, they achieve it by 
tempo, but then they lose out on everything else that is what makes this music exciting, which is all of the left hand and the, the interesting uh, bowing phrasing uh, you're using. So um, yeah, don't don't go for the, the cheap thrill of the fast right away. <laughs> um, I'm going to put it back to the bow view because you, again, you can try to copy the bowings because I know you guys know how to shift. So let's take it slow first time and we'll speed it up a little bit second time around. So one, two, from the top. And... Well, I forgot to mention two things. Uh, first, there's a B part pickup, which you may have noticed. Uh, B to A. And I'm often slurring it in, to, again, to avoid having that strong beat accent. Between the Bs as well. Right, so that one extra note we didn't mention before. Also, how to end it, because it has this kind of circular thing when you have this ending it makes you want to go back and play it again so how do you end it uh you just you make it up <laughs> it feels a little bit weird to end on the third so i would maybe just play like a beginning of the first phrase of the a part and stop when it gets to the tonic uh, for example something like that or go into another tune it's very common practice to to form medleys uh out of multiple tunes, um, just go going straight in from one to the other. So you could go into another tune or you could end it there. Um, great. Any questions about that tune, melodically speaking, or bowings or left hand stuff or anything? Uh, I might try to save like a few minutes at the end. I know we started a few minutes late. So if you guys have questions, uh, think about them now. Uh, we'll just have a, a quick um, sort of chordal analysis of what's going on here and also some rhythmic ideas for jigs. Um, if you're in a session, what are some good techniques to um, to use uh, to, to back up a jig? Um, and maybe that's more important than chords actually, because you can kind of do that chordal analysis thing for yourself. Um, very simple uh, bow pattern for a jig. Um, again, you started with this just back and forth. Actually going a little bit more off the string here um, it, it works a little bit better for jigs I think it depends on the tempo also uh, when it's slower like this the, the off the string thing works a little bit better but let's just try that just to start kind of and get get comfortable with this back and forth idea of the right hand just moving constantly so we're gonna just start on a down bow every bar and accent every three Actually playing it as a as a unison to get a little more sound the open string so not very interesting right um so we have to introduce uh, the element of syncopation to to get a little bit more rhythmic interest here um so what i'm going to do is i'm going to accent keep the bow moving like that back and forth constantly again 
this is your metronome and it's doing all the subdividing for you. Um, so you never have to think about bow direction. Um, and I'm going to add an extra accent. So I'm going to start feeling groups of two over the three. One, two, three. Well, it is in two, right? The big beat is two. Two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So I'm gonna do a little hemiola action. Um, and I'm gonna accent one, two, one, two, three, or one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. So one and three are my accents, and they're gonna both end up falling on down bows with this back and forth thing, the way we're doing it. So what I want you to do is try this. Um, this is a sort of a constant subdivision and we're going to to get the accents to speak we're going to play them on two strings and the non-accented notes we're just going to play on one string so i'm going to go sort of between g and b and then down to the g string for the non-accents and to make it more noticeable you can play maybe d and a They're also like I'm traveling a little bit more. I'm kind of pu pulling, pulling the string a little bit further. I'm using more bow pressure. And I want it to balance a little bit. So there's a little bit of space between the notes. I'm not staying on the string as much now. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit off the string. So when you speed it up, it feels like that. So that's got a nice kind of nice beat to it. So what I, w I would use that in the A part. And um, again, I mentioned this sort of not resolving thing. So you can, um, let's just try it with just with two chords. I'm going to go. Sorry, that's very high in my singing register, but I'm going to end that uh, on a four chord, which gives us that nice unresolved feeling again. So it's all D really, but you can sort of interpret it in other ways. You can say, okay, well that, I want a chord change there. That's the end of a phrase. So there's other ways to harmonize that. You could harmonize it with a B minor. Or you could harmonize it with a G, which has more of that open feel. Has a nice major seven sound, a little bit of dissonance. So I'm gonna try that. I'm gonna do three bars of D and one bar of G. And then it makes me want to go back and play the one chord again, which is, so it feels very satisfying to come back to the D after that. Um, and then on my second ending, I'm looking at the, what are the notes here? That B is pretty prominent in the second bar. So I'm going to treat that as a, just one long G chord. Um, so you, it's the same as the first phrase, but I'm going to hit the G a little sooner on phrase two. So the whole thing sounds like this. Right? So two bars of G on the second ending. So let's try that. Um, uh, so again, always going between the two strings and just the one string for the non-accented notes. Um, and that, I'm just voicing them as fifths right now, but you could choose a different voice and you could go, you could keep the D down, use the third this time, because we're in a major key. And then for the G, you could just keep that D down in the bass, so it has more of a pedal, droney like sound. Let's try that one. So you've got to keep that rhythm constant throughout the A part, just um, accenting one and three of a bar of six. Really good basic jig pattern to get some rhythmic excitement um, into the system. And then when we get to the B part, I want to have like a completely different picture, harmonically and rhythmically speaking. So here, I'll just teach you this very quickly. I know we only, we're running out of time here, but um, I'm going to go to the minor, relative minor, and introduce a B minor chord. And then here, I'm going to introduce a new chord, which 
is taking the A, which falls on the strong beat on the um, on the downbeat, and harmonizing it differently. So the A in the beginning was the seventh of a B minor chord. Da, 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 da. I'm gonna now make it the third of an F sharp minor chord because I like the way that sounds. It's a little bit dissonant against the melody when the melody lands on the B, but you also have to think about the bass line as being it. It's sort of its own melody, so it, it works independently of the melody as well. And it's far enough in register, you can kind of get away with um, doing some of these chordal substitutions. Now I'm going to treat that A at the beginning of phrase three as the ninth of a G major chord. It has a very different sound there, um, but it's kind of the same as phrase one, but now it's G instead of B minor, so completely different. And then let's end on a five chord, the most tension chord in music. So again, it feels like it wants to resolve there, but I'm not letting it yet. So B minor for two bars, F sharp minor. Again, I'm just playing these kind of as fifths, or the B minor I played as a third because it's easier on your hand. You don't have to bar. Fifth. Another fifth. Fifth. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk down. I'm going to reverse the position of the F sharp minor and the B minor. I know that they both work over that A in the melody. So I'm going to change directions this time just to to give it a different feel. So I'm gonna go walk down to the F sharp. So I'm thinking about the bass line now that I want it to move in steps. Uh, so it's like sort of a melodic treatment of a bass line. Then reverse directions. And then I'm going to do something completely different on the second ending because I want to bring the energy back up so that I want to go back and play an A part again. So I'm going to do a little syncopation here and sort of a, a, a very typical chord progression, which is um, in jazz, it's a 2-5-1. And, and in classical music, that happens all the time too. Um, but I'm, instead of just going straight from the 2 to the 5, I'm going to walk up to it and I'm going to use some syncopation. Going to use a scale and I'm just going to harmonize each of those as fifths. So E minor to F sharp minor to G and the last bar that five chord is going to take us back to that, that A part uh, riff. Uh, and the, the rhythmic nature here, I'm going to go so the F sharp and the G are both anticipated. So or I'm saying the wrong ending, but that's <laughs> that's the rhythm. And that's going to be our transition. Okay, so um, let's try that whole B part. I know that was a lot of information. Maybe we can split it into two pieces. So we have B minor for two bars, and I'm just going to play these as long notes because it's nice to have different approaches to the two sections. So A part is very rhythmic. B part is more about this harmonic motion. So I'm going to just play these as long chords. Uh, F sharp minor, to G, A, and walk down to F sharp. Back to the B minor. Then this big walk up, which is very syncopated. Back to rhythm, A part. Um, you're right. So I'm actually using another chop there to kind of place these syncopations. So before the F sharp, you can put a one uh, just sort of stop on the string. And it happens on the beat two of the bar. Okay, so let's do it in time. B part. One, two, three, and...
something like that. And you could make, uh, sort of connect these bass notes in the B part a little bit uh, to, to make it more melodic. Uh, so you could go, just kind of follow the scales. introduce the rhythm a bar sooner to, to sort of again sort of um, make that transition a smooth one between A and B. Um, so that's the approach really just learn a melody try to make it as stylistically accurate as possible um, get some interesting bowing um, to make your rhythmic phrasing exciting um, get some language in your left hand um, and uh, and then you can kind of take the tune apart um, at the roots and uh, and figure out what works harmonically and then some different sort of groove approaches to different sections uh, then you, we didn't get much into the chord voicings or um, using different textures but um, you can explore these things more on your own um, I think we're out of time so does anybody have any questions or, or any comments Can free, feel free to unmute yourself and say hello. <laughs> um, I just have a one small question. Would just be um. Oh, sorry. I'm trying to keep myself unmuted. Mm -hmm. Um, just to um. To keeping learning um more tunes like this. Would you just suggest listening more? Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, there, there's loads of of written resources out there, but. Uh, they kind of lack a lot of information, <laughs> vital information, um, which a lot of this stuff doesn't get notated because it's just so personal to the player. So um, the left hand stuff and the Boeing stuff um, really is what makes everybody unique. So often people won't put that in notation um, because it's you want to have your own kind of individual stamp on the music. So yeah, I, I would recommend listening uh, to fiddle players. Um, Martin Hayes, great one to start with um, and uh, copying as much as you can. Um, you know, it's harder to hear bowings from recordings, but YouTube is a great resource. Um, you can copy left-hand stuff from, from recordings. Um, Amazing Slow Downer is a wonderful program. If, if you guys haven't heard about that, it'll be the best money you've ever spent in your life. If you really want to explore this learning by ear stuff, um, it allows you to um, just uh, drop in a recording and slow it down to, to whatever speed you want. And you can um, keep the pitch the same or change the pitch or just loop a section. It, it's just a very valuable tool um, for learning by ear. And uh, yeah, just listening to, to whoever takes your fancy and trying to copy as much as you can from, from that person. And then eventually you'll sort of distill down everything you like from each player and make your own style. Good, good question. <laughs> Anybody else comments or questions? Uh, well, if not, then I uh, just want to say big thanks to all of you uh, for, for being here and for participating. It's great to meet you all. That's great. Thank you so much, Natalie. My thank pleasure. You. Thanks, That's been great. Thanks.